Awesome. Thank you so much. Ah, yes. Okay. So there's actually the recording. So I hope that you guys yes. were taking copious and detailed notes while Baker was explaining all of that. Um, if not, all the more reason to join our mailing list. Um, okay, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Lois Rawson. I am a PhD candidate um, in UC Berkeley's Department of History. Uh, and I'm very excited to introduce today's workshop, um, The Art of the Op-Ed, How to Reach Audiences Beyond the Academy, um, or as one of my colleagues recently put it, um, how to write about stuff that you know and reach an audience beyond people who already know that stuff. Um, which is actually a little bit closer to what we're trying to get at. Um, this was a really fun panel to organize, um, and I think it's going to have a lot of really useful information for folks who are interested um, in publishing in places outside of traditional academic journals. Um, and somewhat relatedly, um, I was thinking today about a lecture on um, 19th century print culture that I've sat in on once uh, with a faculty member in the history department. Um, and one of the things that he reminded the undergrads of is sort of the proximity of the word publish to the word public. Um, and for most folks at this particular moment uh, in the history of print culture, appearing in print was functionally the same thing as appearing in public. Um, and I don't know that we think about these things as being so intimately related these days, uh, but as we start to live more of our lives online, um, it's definitely interesting to consider the extent to which um, we're represented by the words that we write, uh, where they circulate, um, and of course, who reads them. So on that note, um, it is my very great pleasure to introduce the folks that we're going to be hearing from today. Um, I'll be co-moderating uh, with Patrick McRae, professor of history at UC Santa Barbara. Hello, Patrick. Um, he himself is a scholarship publishing maestro, so I hope that he will um, chime in at various intervals. Um, and as you may have seen on our flyer, uh, we will be facilitating a conversation between um, Victoria Massey, um, Michelle Pridmore Brown, and Lee Vinsall. Um, Victoria Massey um, is wrapping up a PhD um, in sociocultural anthropology here at Berkeley um, with a designated emphasis in science and technology studies. Um, and I'm also very happy to announce that this summer she'll be moving to Houston to take up an assistant professorship at Rice University. So congratulations, Victoria. We'd love to hear it. Um, Michelle Pridmore Brown is the founding editor of the science section of the LA Review of Books um, has been, and has been truly instrumental in orienting it towards STS topics. Um, she herself also writes essays and reviews for both popular and also scholarly publications. Um, and she is currently a research fellow with the Center for Medicine, Science and Technology right here at Berkeley. Uh, and from outside of the Bay Area, um, we've also got the pleasure of hosting Lee Vinsall, uh, who is an associate professor in the Department of Science, Technology, and Society at Virginia Tech. Uh, and Lee is a co-director of the Maintainers Project, um, a global interdisciplinary research network um, that's focused on maintenance, repair, uh, and the mundane types of work that keep our world going. Uh, his work has appeared or been covered uh, in the New York Times, Guardian, um, The Atlantic, um, and a whole bunch of other outlets around the world that I'm sure you guys have heard of. Um, so one big gigantic thank you to our presenters for being so generous with their time and also their insights. Um, we all hope to one day copy you and emulate your successes. Um, and on that note, I'm going to um, hand the floor over um, to each of our panelists so that they can walk us through sort of the specifics of some of their experiences um, with publishing in greater detail. And then Patrick and I will sort of transition into a moderated conversation. Um, and as Baker already mentioned, um, we're definitely going to have time for questions at the end. Um, so if uh, a question strikes you, um, pop it in the chat and we will try to get to it sort of towards um, the end of the panel. So um, on that note, um, Victoria, I will hand the floor over to you and then we'll hear from Michelle and Lee. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lois, and everyone involved with the STS Futures Initiative. Um, so uh, for my presentation, I'm just going to talk a bit about um, <laughs> my not quite so linear um, path. Um, to engaging with kind of writing outside of academia um, and how that has actually been very informative about the way I write as an academic. Um, 
So one thing, you know, one of the, uh, with joining the panel, you know, I think it's a kind of question about um, balance and how exactly do I even try to strive for um, writing publicly while also worry, worrying about um, the responsibilities that come with being a graduate student. And I think for me, I've been really fortunate that the question of whether I never had to deal with the question of whether I would engage with the public in part because I come from a family of educators, particularly black educated educators who take kind of public engagement as a kind of responsibility. Um, so it wasn't a matter of whether I would opt into this kind of work, but it was more so for me figuring out the, my responsibility, my duty was to figure out the how. And so for my time as a graduate student, it's really been taking the craft of writing very seriously um, and experimenting with that um, to get a sense of voice. Um, you know, I think when we talk about um, the work of op-ed, you know, it's one thing, yes, we should be having conversations about how to do X, Y, and Z and pitch and all these various things, but um, I think we do ourselves a disservice when we don't take very seriously asking ourselves, you know, do like for if, if not asking yourself, do you have a sense of your own voice? But also in kind of recognizing what the terms of what your voice can or should be, um, sec like asking yourself a secondary question of what do you need to do for yourself to make sense of your voice? Um, that I think is absolutely fundamental to doing any of this work. And so for me, there's no way to engage with the kind of my path toward writing publicly um, without dealing with, for instance, uh, my initial engagement with writing that were around poetry and performing poetry um, in downtown Oakland um, during my first year um, and at slam poetry events, both in the Bay Area, but also nationally. And I say this because one of the things that I got from that experience was really having to recognize we're really reckoning with like what exactly is the public again these kind of <laughs> what is the we talk about the public as a kind of big um universal kind of thing and when you are trying to figure out your voice you also have to deal with kind of who is your audience and what kind of conversations are you willing to have there's no way to engage with the public when you're not ethically at least if you don't have a sense of that very critical relationship and so you know i took i gave myself the space to not just craft my voice, but also take pride and play. <laughs> I think we sometimes take this so seriously, we don't actually allow ourselves the joy of figuring out what our voice is in this process. And so it's like for me, using these moments in a, in a club, um, working through my thoughts about Merleau-Ponty <laughs> after my pro seminar um, on a Wednesday evening. And, you know, these were, I was dealing with, I was performing with and for people who did who had not read Merleau-Ponty. This <laughs> is not a thing, but nonetheless, it was a kind of way for me to clarify my thoughts and also think about what it means to clarify my thoughts for an audience. Like, what does it mean to think through this metaphor of like man as a thing via Merleau-Ponty and these questions of ontology um, here? And like not presuming that that kind of conversation is impossible. Like, you know, where, where do you situate your kind of sense of expertise? I think it's really, really important. Um, and allowing myself to be transformed accordingly. Like it, it was helpful. I think the, the immediacy of kind of performance is that you figure out if something lands or not. <laughs> it's very easy to figure out if you communicated something effectively because if something's dead silent, you crickets, like, okay, something's off. Um, or maybe it's not the appropriate audience or maybe um, something did work and like, okay, so leaning into that. I mean, really just trying to, um, yeah, give myself space to figure that out. Um, and, you know, one of the, one uh, po uh, poetry piece that I think of very often with this, which um, was like, for instance, by the time I was doing my quals and thinking through very vividly, you know, yes, questions of STS, but also even like kinship studies and thinking about kinship as methodology, you know, for me, giving myself space to think through kind of analogies of biology, very STS, and like for me with my work, um, dealing with genetic ancestry and questions of racial, contemporary racialization um, today, I'm thinking about um, kind of an anti a story of anti-racism in my own family 
um, via the metaphor of apoptosis, and which is a kind of programmed cell death for people who may or may not know. Um, but using that as a kind of metaphor for thinking through uh, my great grandmother, who was a black woman who could pass and would often weaponize her relationship to whiteness to call out the, the issues of whiteness itself to protect my family. And, you know, it's like that kind of way of just like, figuring out, giving myself space to experiment with the critical questions that are integral to my work um, in a space that is not necessarily conventional for doing that. Um, and so via that kind of process, that was kind of helpful for me to, as I gain clarity on my voice, take the next step of writing publicly. So um, worth noting that when I talk about writing publicly, like I did, I worked as a journalist, I wrote at Vox, I've written at The Intercept, um, I've written for blogs before that, um, and I've also written for literary journals. And a lot of that is like me figuring out, like using the, um, these different spaces to again think about questions of race, social justice, technology, science, scientific knowledge, knowledge production, but like again in practice and having to also just learn the mechanics of public writing. Like it, it is, it is some journalism is its own kind of platform. And there's what does it mean to work with an editor? And again, with voice, um, it's important to I think take that part seriously because when you're working with editors, when you're working with people at bigger outlets, you know, it is a conversation um, to have with these different people. And if you don't know your own voice, it's very easy for your voice to get lost in the process. And so then once you're out in a bigger public, um, what are you going to be able to do um, to protect yourself and just like create a kind of safety um, for yourself? Um, and then kind of later on, um, when thinking about publics um, and my writing, uh, focusing on creative writing workshops. And so I am a nonfiction fellow with the Hurston Wright Foundation, which is specifically um, for black writers. And that's for nonfiction, fiction, as well as poetry. I happen to have done it with nonfiction. And that was a kind of way for me to think about um, public without this kind of universal. Like for me, I think it really is imperative given the my work, like I'm not necessarily aiming for everybody. I think I write in a way that I take seriously. I think people, like I, I write in a way that I don't foreclose necessarily people from reading it, but I'm not writing for everybody. I take, I'm writing for in many respects black people because that's who I work with and getting the confidence to kind of feel um, my way in that niche and recognizing um, that that again is its own kind of skill. And I think it's a really important skill to kind of know where, which kind of like conversational ecosystem, especially kind of digital media that you're engaging with um, to make sure that your work lands where it should. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. Amazing. Oh my gosh, Victoria, thank you. Um, one thing that your your presentation just reminded me of, um, you know, is the, the fact that sometimes writing actually just can be fun, right? Yes. And sometimes you can enjoy it and relish it. Um, this might be because I'm actively still dissertating, but sometimes when I think about writing other things, I'm like, oh yes, clearly I must suffer through that process. Um, I, I was also, <laughs> yeah. And it's like, even for me with like now finishing up writing my dissertation, there's, um, you know, when we get to the later stage, I often hear from people where it feels like um, the dissertation, they don't see themselves. And a lot of it is the question of voice. And, you know, it's unfortunate that with the pedagogy of, of graduate training, um, more often than not, people are not taught how to write. And they're certainly not taught how to write as themselves. It's like you, you grow into it later. I don't think that's necessary. But um, I think my experiences with writing elsewhere have allowed me to, I think, come into writing dissertation and be creative. It's, I mean, it, it is painful. I'm not going to act like it's not as I'm finishing it up. Um, but some parts have been enjoyable just because I know, I know my voice well enough that I also know how to make an intervention via form in a way that I might not have if I hadn't done that kind of um, other forms of writing outside of academia. So I think also one of the things I want to reiterate to people is that this kind of engage this, this notion of public writing, public engagement, it does not have to be kind of binary between academia and the public or people or working with people outside of, uh, outside of the ivory tower. Um, 
we also should be thinking about the ways that those experiences can be brought back into the work you do as a scholar. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Victoria, thank you so much for sharing. Um, let's turn it over to Michelle and we can hear about her experiences both with writing um, and with publishing and she can walk us through, um, you know, maybe some of the nuts and bolts of, um, you know, sort of what a pitch looks like and what is the anatomy of a successful one. Um, so, so hello. Um, that was absolutely amazing, Victoria, because I am always trying to tell writers that they need to develop their voices and how do you do that? And it's, and it just, it just seems so hard to be able to be, you know, convey to, especially to young people that, you know, it's okay. You can take risks. You can be playful. You, you know, you're what you, you, if you have fun writing this, then people will have fun reading it. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit, uh, I think, first about the um, LA Review of Books, uh, which is where I think you should all publish. <laughs> um, so uh, this is actually its 10th anniversary, and I joined in um, 2012, so, so, so a few months after it launched, and um, I was in charge of the science section, and of course, what I wanted to do was to gear it towards um, STS topics. And, you know, that seemed like a no brainer. That's what interests me. That's where I think the, you know, the interesting stuff is happening. Um, so, uh, you know, what I did is I rather innocently um, approached um, Stephen Shapin and said, you know, hey, do you want to write a piece? <laughs> and, um, you know, very graciously, he did. He wrote a piece on cannibalism, on people eating people. Um, and um, that piece did incredibly well. And then he put me in touch with um, other um, STS scholars um, who we, you know, scholars who had voices, <laughs> as, as you might say. And, um, um, you know, then before, and a few years later, Massimo was writing uh, pieces. He wrote a piece, Faking Galileo, that, you know, pretty much went viral. Um, um, and then I had the good fortune of um, locating Patrick McRae, <laughs> our moderator, who um, you know, has written wonderful pieces. And I think um, if you want to, you know, if you want to write for a public audience, what you need to do is to just look at some of these pieces by the pros. Um, uh, you know, all of them are good at different things. Some of them are good at all things. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that, but um, you know, different people have different genres that you know they excel at. Um, um, so you know, at at um, the LARB, um, we basically have you know five. I, what I would call five genres. One is the straight review. Um, the straight review, you think, oh, that sounds kind of dry. No, not at all. You you have you have to treat it like an opinion piece. Like you know, you're it, it's you're using the review for your own purposes. You're using the book you're reviewing for your own purposes. Um, it's 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 a, it's a mechanism. It's a vehicle for you. Um, so that's one format. The the other one is the essay review. Um, that would be where you take on, you know, three or four or five books and you really stake your territory. You put those books in conversation with, with each other. Um, there's very good reasons to do that, um, it, especially if you have that kind of brain, the sort of synthetic brain that um, likes to do that. Um, there's the, the straightforward op-ed. Um, you could look at, you know, if you want to, you know, a, a format for that, you could look at Morgan Ames's piece on um, why we shouldn't, you know, obviously should not trust um, tech experts or tech insiders uh, on, you know, how to raise our children. Um, Jessica Riskin uh, wrote a really short but really good one. You should, you know, again, you could look at that on, you know, why Trump is not a conservative. Um, um, then there's the, the other format is the long discursive essay, um, which you may prefer. There's some people 
for whom, you know, writing 1,500 words is agonizing. They need the 3,000 to 10,000 format. Um, I would say Mario Giajoli is one of those people, or Massimo. He's written some great long essays. Um, and then, um, and I think this is important um, for uh, like PhD students or postdocs, there's the interview. So let's say, you know, you're feeling kind of nervous. Why not start with an interview? So, you know, maybe you have somebody to whose work you find very interesting that you like a lot or that you hate a lot, um, you know, interview them um, and then write up the interview. Um, or stage a conversation uh, between various um, experts on a topic that can work really well. For instance, I have a, um, a graduate student who writes for me who exploited the pandemic to basically launch his writing career. Um, you know, this is probably somebody who was more, you know, not so extroverted. Um, it was a safe way to, to to launch himself, he interviewed eight historians of you know, epidemics and catastrophes in a piece entitled Pandemic Narratives and the Historian. Um, then, you know, getting his feet wet like that, he went on to do to, to um, review Jill Lepore's book because it was related to his dissertation. And then from there, you know, he got even more confident. His review was, did, it did really well. Um, you know, and now he's doing another review that's, you know, more tangentially re related to his dissertation. So you can see sort of the stepping stones. Um, but again, different people, you know, have different genres that they prefer. And, um, you know, it's related to your personality, to your voice, to how, how much courage you have, maybe, um, to how old you are. Um, so let's see. Um, in terms of, you know, more about what I do at LARB, um, so, you know, as a, as a section editor, we're given a lot of autonomy, um, we're, kind, we're kind of siloed, um, you know, we decide what we want to cover, we decide the types of people we want, we'd like to attract, and um, so, you know, so I often try to think about, well, I, I'd like to get this person writing, let me think about what his sweet spot is, or what their sweet spot is and and so then I'll find some forthcoming books and I'll you know feed the the, the person um, these books and you know hopefully they can't resist or a topic where they can't resist so that's one side so you know we have a lot of the leading lights but then just as much we're trying to encourage you know the younger people to develop their voices and to um, pitch to us um, um, and so I, you know, I would say we have an equal number of, 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 of people who don't have big portfolios and who are, you know, again, finding their feet. Um, and I want to, so I think I, I, I'll save the, you know, talking about the nuts and bolts of pitches for maybe a little bit later during the moderated discussion. Um, because, you know, that's, yeah, there's, there's a lot that I should probably say there. Um, Maybe I'll just finish by saying, you know, yes, I myself write too. I used to write quite a bit for the LA um, Review, but um, not so much anymore because I like having an editor who edits me. And I'm, you know, <laughs> so I write more for other publications. Um, but I write on a mishmash of topics. I write on, you know, IVF. I write on Jane Austen. I write on, um, uh, Asperger's syndrome, I write on, you know, how women select sperm, I write on birth control, biological clocks, you know, just a potpourri of, of, of topics. Um, uh, so, and then uh, one more thing, maybe once I've um, developed a pitch, I think I function like a sort of like a developmental editor. I, you know, I, I'm, I try to make the person hone their ideas. I try to make them hone their voice, but that's really hard to do. Um, um, I, I'm a fairly aggressive editor, but then I expect people to push back. I hope they'll push back. I like it to be a dialogue. Um, 
that's where it's much more fun um, for me. Um, but it's all, you know, it's all about precision, about developing the metaphors, about making things vivid, about honing their meaning. You know, people can be a little bit fluffy and they, you know, you want them to be as precise as possible, as concrete as possible, to use the examples to, to show rather than only just tell. And sometimes people go through 10 drafts. Sometimes the first draft is just so perfect that, you know, <laughs> I barely do anything. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Michelle, before we seg over to Lee, I had a quick question since we're doing really well on schedule here. Um, my question is this, I mean, so I really appreciated your description of all the different genres. I never really thought about how they broke down that way. And I also appreciate the fact, having benefited from this, of you, one of your other roles is to be a cheerleader for authors and, um, and to encourage them and to remind them that they can actually do it, which is always nice to hear. I was just curious, whenever you have this whole stable of potential um, uh, reviewers and authors, how do you decide which book should get paired up with which voice? Because you mentioned a bunch of different authorial voices, and I'd be kind of curious briefly to hear your thought on that. Well, so what we do is um, we see what's coming up the pipeline in terms of books, for instance, and um, we'll put them into categories and say, oh, you know, for instance, these four books look like they could go really well together. Oh, that's so and so sweet spot. Let's see if we can get that person engaged. Um, uh, sometimes somebody will come to us and say, oh, I'd like really, you know, I hear there's this book, I'd really like to, to, to write about it, or I'm just looking for a book to review, what do you have? Okay, so a number of different avenues then um, that, that yeah. one could find themselves going down. Yeah. All right, cool. That's really helpful. Lois, I think if it's okay with you, we'll um, bounce over to Lee in, uh, in Virginia. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk through a, a couple of different issues. I, I took the, the op-ed thing kind of literally, so I think I might start there. Uh, and that's just, a, I will start by talking about failure. So I've, uh, I've not had a lot of success uh, pitching traditional op-eds via the uh, portals on newspaper uh, web pages. Uh, it's something that a lot of people will suggest you do um, for op-eds. I've done it many times in different contexts over the course of my career, and I've failed almost always. Um, so that I'll just start there with uh, a lot of times writing doesn't work out for whatever reason. Recently, the maintainers, uh, the group I work with, we uh, successfully placed a piece on the Texas blackout in the Hill. Um, and we did that via the Scholars Strategy Network, which is a group some folks might want to check out. It, it helps scholars place uh, op-eds basically. Uh, you have to join, there's a process to, to join. Um, Initially in my career, when I was writing for, you know, non-academic audiences, um, I, I had the most luck at kind of the academic public boundary spaces, um, which is how I think of places like blogs uh, in newspapers or places like that written, run by academics. So I had, um, I wrote for a now dead blog at Bloomberg about gendered crash test dummies. Uh, I've written for the Washington Post history blog and Eon is kind of, I think about this kind of place. And I've also written for the conversation, which I think is a very approachable place. I really um, suggest people reach out to there to any kind of, kind of op-ed-y things. Um, and the nice thing about, I've written about a number of pieces for the conversation, including stuff about um, autonomous vehicles and things. The nice thing is that the conversations pieces then get syndicated out to other places and they end up all over uh, in all kinds of publications eventually uh, and that's nice. I think part of uh, the from in my experience and it, it resonates very much with what I love what Victoria said I think a lot of this has to do with building an identity uh, as a writer and a reputation um, as someone who wants to and has written for non-academic audiences in it in my experiences and the experiences of my friends who do this this takes years of work, ultimately. I totally agree with what Victoria said about voice. I think that's a big part of the ticket. Um, and in front of, you know, for me, the trick, and I know this is a trick lots of people use, um, is uh, 
my audience is always some group of friends of mine. So I write some things that, that are kind of at the pop uh, academic boundary um, where I'm writing more for academic friends and trying to make them laugh basically. Um, and then I also write, um, you know, I write pieces where I'm thinking about my college buddies who are not academics, who I play Dungeons and Dragons with, uh, who are smart and, you know, educated, but they're not, you know, they're not academics. And I, I think like, will this interest introduce my, uh, interest my buddies? And that's kind of how I think about audience. Um, so for me, uh, you know, for like lots of people, it, Blogging was the place I started. I wrote a bunch of embarrassing blog pieces and kind of conducted my education in public, which means I fumbled a lot um, as a young person. But that was really important for the reasons Victoria outlined of finding a voice. I still post things to Medium, um, the kind of blogging web uh, thing, fairly often. Um, and I've had quite a bit of success with that. So my essay. Uh, with the kind of jokey title, design thinking is kind of like syphilis, it's contagious and rots your brains, has been read in, you know, it got picked up by the Chronicle of Higher Education. It's been read about 200,000 times in its life in different um, kind of ways. And recently I wrote a piece about criti-hype, uh, what I call criti-hype, criticism that feeds hype, and it's been read about 20,000 times. So I find that um, a lot of times these things they also get picked up. I've had blog pieces get picked up by Eon, Fast Company, and The Chronicle. Um, so that's kind of a thing I like to do too sometimes, is just write the ideas in the funnest way possible. And then people will come along and be like, I love this. Can we just post it? Or, and I'll be like, sure, do that. Um, so, um, and you know, the, I, I mentioned the number of reads because for me, it really is about getting readers. I, and like, so, you know, there's the famous, journal articles being read by 10 other human beings or something like that right and I, I think that's a bogus number but like the point is like a lot of things you write as a as an academic are just not going to get picked up or read and so i really actually want to communicate with readers um at this point because of the reputation building a lot of writing opportunities actually come from me to me i should say and so part it's about um building a network and, and getting people, getting a reputation and, and getting people, you know, just building editors, for instance, that you can reach out to. So for instance, the New York Times uh, piece on maintenance that Andy Russell and I wrote, uh, that was actually an editor there just reached out to us because we had done the Eon piece and said they wanted another version of it, basically. And then another uh, part of, while we're work working with another editor there, she just was talking to us, asking for pitches, uh, my buddy Andy Russell said, like, how about uh, an, an op-ed about how standards are in everything, standard, like technical standards are in everything, and they kind of rule the world. And I laughed because I thought there's no way in a million years that's going to work. She was like, I love it. Do that. So that was like our standards piece. And it turned out she came from the tech industry and written a book on standards already. So we didn't even realize what we were pitching. But anyway, try it. Um, so I also think, you know, then part of it is building social networks, I think, with pe other people um, who are interested in doing this. You know, I think, you know, this is this starts in grad school and, and continues professionally, um, you know, finding other people who want to work for broader audiences. Um, and I think it helps to have charitable friends. So uh, Patrick, for instance, connected, I'd already written for Eon, but he connected me with Sam Hasselby, me and Sam, uh, Andy with Russell with Sam Hasselby, and that led to our Hail the Maintainers essay, which, you know, um, which kind of started the maintainers in a lot of way. And he also connected with me with Michelle, um, who I've written for a couple of times now. So, I mean, you build networks and you're, 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 that's a part of the process is getting to know editors, getting to know friends who work for audiences. Um, you know, I can talk about a lot of other friends who I work with editors through, and that's just part of the, the overall process of what you're trying to do. Um, and this day, so here, here's here, Patrick McRae, network entrepreneur. That's right. Uh, and uh, so here's my last point. I think these days, and here's my thing about pitches, because um, I usually am writing editors I know already. And uh, I try to keep my pitches as brief as possible because I know they're busy people and I care about them and don't want to pile them full of whatever. So I preferably try to send a pitch that can get an idea across in like three to four sentences, max, if I can do it. Now, in my experiences, when friends approach me about pitching editors that I know, 
they'll send me something that's like three to four paragraphs. And I'm like, take the topic sentence of each of those paragraphs and put them together. And that's like what you want to run with. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, and then the editor, if they're interested and they think it's a cool idea, they'll ask you if they want to hear more or if something's not clear or whatever. Um, so for, to give an, uh, an example, uh, I wrote a piece for Michelle on uh, Gene Shepard, uh, the radio, radio rock on tour and uh, the movie, The Christmas Story, and the kind of bleak, pessimistic worldview that's a, that's a part of that, including some of the scientific ideas about humans that were around in the 1950s and 1960s. And I think my pitch to Michelle was only a couple sentences long. And she's like, that sounds cool. Do that. So, I mean, that's my that's my pitch advice is especially if you've kind of built a relationship with the person, keep it as brief as humanly possible. And then we can also talk about the glories of working with editors. Um, so, I mean, I love working with editors. When Michelle said, I want to have an editor, I, I love editors. Um, and so with the, the Shepherd piece, for instance, I handed Michelle like a pile of slop. And she somehow transformed it into something that I thought was pretty good in the end. So, I mean, that is that is like maybe my favorite thing about writing for popular audiences is you get to work with really brilliant editors who can make it all come together. And then and I, I think I'll stop there. Thanks a lot, Lee. I had a quick question before we kind of start moving to um, opening up to a wider audience or, or wider set of voices. I guess you described a situation where you've written everything from these um, you know, pieces for like the New York Times, for example, to more longer form essays for Eon. And, you know, I know from, you know, from this that there's a whole array of like timelines that you're working with where the New York Times mm -hmm. wants a much faster turnaround because maybe what you're writing about is extremely topical and timely and it has to come out fast. Whereas like Eon Magazine and that process there unfolds over months sometimes. Yeah. And I was wondering just sort of if you have any thoughts or advice or anecdotes just about managing that timeline because they are different forms of public facing scholarship. Yeah, I mean, I've been lucky in that the Times pieces were more like Sunday review pieces. So they didn't really have like, they didn't have to happen quickly. Um, but, you know, I have written op-eds with colleagues that were very timely. And I mean, I don't really like that kind of writing because it really means life has to stop in a way, right? Like something, when you realize you have something to say and it's got a timeline of like two or three days before it's old news, that means you just need to, um, you know, you, you need to stop everything and just throw it, like throw it together. Um, the only thing, the only charitable thing about that is usually those pieces are pretty short. So you're talking about like 800 words tops, right? And often less than that. Um, so yeah, I mean, that is a form. I think it just has to do with like the, the news cycle more than anything. So yeah. that idea of quality then really explains a lot of Tom Friedman's writing. Yes. <laughs> right, all those, I would say all the, the New York editorial pages, yes, <laughs> yes. Maybe I should have some more sympathy for them. Over to you, Lois. <laughs> Um, okay. Yep. Yeah, incredible. Um, Lee, thank you so much for walking through some, walking us through some of that. Um, so I had a question that's really for all of you, um, but but I think especially related um, to Lee, what you were talking about, and Victoria, also some of the experiences um, that you're mentioning. Um, I've heard before that for grad students, like in terms of publications, going from zero to one is really, really hard. And then from one to two, it like starts to get a little bit easier. And then like, as you progress, like you become a little bit more confident as a writer um, and things start to run a little bit more smoothly. Um, Speaking in healthy I statements, I know that one of the things that I really struggle with is, you know, having an idea for something that could potentially be an article. Um, and then I like go to try to draft it out. And I'm like, oh my God, this is literally the most garbage thing that anyone has ever written. And I like mentally block it away and I like never return to it. And if I could just get from there to like, hey, maybe actually this is fine and I can send it in and solicit some feedback and maybe Michelle is actually not going to call the police, um, then I would actually be a little bit more productive of a writer. Um, so I was wondering if you guys like had any insights into like, like if that was a thing that you experienced, like how you got over that. Um, and then also, um, Lee, you brought up uh, failure, like <laughs> maybe some pitches that you had that like didn't work or that somebody was like, actually, um, I am calling 
calling the police, um, that would be really great. So I don't know if, yeah, if you guys have thoughts on this. Um, yeah, I can speak to <laughs> those points, uh, a few of those points. Um, so um, I'm presuming when you talk about articles, like it's it's the public articles, not like yeah. <laughs> academic or, yeah, okay. Totally. Um, the, so I think one thing is like offering yourself grace on like what exactly feels timely about the thing that you're trying to write about. So there's like, for instance, an article I mean, or an essay, it's not an article, a uh, creative nonfiction essay that I wrote for Catapult. Mm. It was actually based on a fieldwork experience I had in 2015. And I didn't, I had been thinking about it for so long. And even right now I'm like, you know, I was thinking about possibly having for the dissertation, I'm just saving it for the book. <laughs> but, um, you know, I finally started to actually get the space to think through this kind of experience that I found to be um, kind of calling to me in 2017. 2017 is when I finally drafted the pitch, just like contacted the editor and wrote a kind of, wrote something, wrote through it. Um, and so I think when you're, <laughs> you know, when I say grace, it's about time, but it's also, I mean, just give yourself space to work it out. Doesn't, I think some, we do this, this is kind of writing and kind of the process of knowledge reduction and thinking in general. It's like, you aren't necessarily going to know the thing <laughs> immediately. Um, and maybe that's also one of the benefits of writing publicly with the editor. <laughs> like I had immense anxiety about writing that piece. And my editor at the, it was just so like generous and kind. I like kept asking for a bit of like extensions and she was fine with it. But then I sent it to her, she's like, what, what are you, what are you doing? Like it's not, it's not trash, you know, all the ways we kind of preemptively um, foreclose that for ourselves. Um, and then with failures, like please do not be afraid to fail. I've had many a pitch um, <laughs> be declined. And, um, you know, sometimes it's a matter of, you know, it's trying to figure out sometimes a sweet spot of how, what's the, the perfect moment, like early in the morning, <laughs> like whatever point in the morning to pitch an editor who has to go to the East Coast versus the West Coast, you know, these things. But it's also like, a matter of making sure to match your story with the outlet, or sometimes it's just not good and somebody might actually be saving you a lot by not allowing you to write that piece. Not everything needs to be written or you need to take a step back and that's okay. Um, it's like, you know, what, do, what do you, it's also like redefining, what do you mean by failure? <laughs> like, you know, is it, are you just trying, if success is only going to be about you getting something placed, like you're setting yourself up some really serious traps um, that you might not need. Like, again, being declined is sometimes a, a godsend. <laughs> At least that's what I've seen. I don't know, Lee, Michelle. Um, I would say that's, that's so true. Um, for, I remember, so I had, um, I had uh, written a piece for the London Review of Books and then I thought after I finished that, okay, I'm gonna pitch another one. I went and looked for a good book to review, what I thought was a good book to review, wrote a pitch. The guy goes, uh-uh. And I'm and then afterwards I received the book. I had I had gotten an advanced copy. I received my book and I thought, oh my goodness, thank you know, I'm so grateful. <laughs> he he told me no. Yeah. I didn't waste time. Um, but yeah, no, you have to. I mean, the same people who get pitches in are the people who get them rejected. Yeah. You know, I mean, you just have to pitch and pitch and pitch and you get, and you get better and better at it. And you, you learn how to articulate us, you know, this central nugget. Um, and that's, you know, that's like a muscle that you develop. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can't be afraid of failure. Yeah. I totally agree with all that. I mean, I, I've been thinking back to when I, I started at Stevens Institute of Technology in 2012. That was a university I worked at for a, five years. And, you know, there was a period where I was trying to break into kind of more public writing. And I, I just got rejected a lot, you know. And thankfully, at that time, I mean, I think the one thing that for our, you know, generation and a half, these last couple of generations, we do have blogs that we can go to and keep like writing for friends and stuff. So there's always like, there's always an outlet to keep doing that work, even when you're not breaking in. And then 
then I think, you know, Lois, where you started about like learning and this process of experience, I totally, that's been my experience at least. Like you find your voice, you start finding, you gain more confidence and then, you know, you get cocky eventually. And then, you know, the, the rejections still come. They never stop, but you know, it stops mattering so much. Can I just add to reiterate the, just emphasize the, the, use, the usefulness of blogs? Like for myself, like that's where I spent a lot of time um, developing my voice, but that's also a matter of like being pragmatic about like a part of pitching a lot of times is also demonstrating you have writing experience before mm -hmm. that. Like, especially when you're dealing with an editor who has, who does not know you, you don't have a particularly like well-known profile, like having clips <laughs> and those clips can be blogs. Um, you know, especially if you're dealing with like, you know, I think about like, for instance, like Somatosphere is an SCS blog, you know, particularly with like anthropology um, that also has people edit you, like all of this, like use those spaces <laughs> to develop a kind of like byline. Um, you know, my initial pitches, like the, when I sent off my, for my piece to The Intercept, like I was citing links to blogs. And I got to do a reported piece off of that because the, the biggest thing beyond just like having a clear direct <laughs> pitch is like they could tell despite like, you know, was my clips were not coming from the New York Times, but it was very clear that I could demonstrate in these pieces, like I knew how to write. Like mm. I was, there was a clarity in my writing that they could take the risk and work with. And so I, yeah, I can't, I can't stress enough like how useful blogs are for this initial stage. I think we sometimes when we talk about op-eds and all this, we like jump, <laughs> we, we skip so many steps. We're just so um, excited to write in the, you know, LA Times, like New York Times, The Guardian, et cetera, et cetera. But like mm. it, it Focusing on crafts like gets you there. It might not get you there immediately, but it'll likely get you there in a way that like has a kind of quality um, that'll allow you to get more out of the experience um, if you hadn't yeah. otherwise. So, yeah. I think, you know, the only the other thing I would add, I totally agree with that. I was thinking about like part of my job now, I work with grad students and other young, you know, young people who are trying to break into this world. And for me, it's always like when they get rejections that actually have some valuable feedback is getting them to see the feedback and learn from it. Because a lot of times, a lot of people want to break into popular writing, but they're not ready yet, right? Like, you know, I have people, we used to, we're trying to do some stuff with the maintainers blog. Uh, and we kind of set that aside for the time being. And, but, you know, we were trying to get people to write, write in a kind of approachable voice because where there's people in industry and all these different spaces that, follow it so we're trying to get you know and they would send these things that were like full of academic jargon and people's names and parentheses and stuff and it was like ah you know like you're you're not they weren't there yet so i mean i there's a learning process you have to go through and i think learning how to hear what editors are telling you and take that on as and really actually gain from it is an important skill to to get yeah i think it's really great that both well, all three of you have been speaking about this sort of nexus of experience and failure. And I think it's also important to remember that, you know, even if you've been doing this for a while and you, you know, are like a, you know, more senior in the field, I mean, you still get rejected all the time. I mean, I mean, just, you know, I get articles turned back, you know, peer review, whatever, you know, editors of newspapers are like, nope. And I, I remember a piece that I sent to or pitched to Michelle since she's here in like 2019 or 2020. And I think I knew as I sent it that it was garbage, but I didn't tell her that of course, but she read it and very kindly said, this is garbage. I'm like, hmm, okay, that's, you know, good yeah. to know. But I think there was also something from the experience kind of what Victoria and Lee, you were speaking to that you kind of maybe get, get an inner sense of it, like of its quality. Um, yeah. I was kind of curious if for the three of you, like thoughts on how you balance, like, you know, like say you've got something really, really great. Do you save it for a book project or an article or do you put it out there in public knowing that um, other writers who have like, you know, you know, have to like produce content might take it and do something, you know, we'll take it and do something else with it and you don't like own it anymore. And i um, just be kind of curious to hear your thoughts uh, on that. Um, um, <laughs> I, I will say, 
I think for me and trying to be strategic about, um, you know, cause it's a part of the work of academia is like, I mean, I've seen like, at least in anthropology, like moves for instance, with the, the anthropology association to finally, you know, include things like public writing as a part of like tenure review, but you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, your bread and butter for the, for the most part are these academic articles. Um, and, you know, for me, I actually have a piece that's currently under review that I had to make a decision on initially, I decided to decline um, making it to a blog post I was invited to write, uh, specifically because, you know, it's just me looking at, I thought the, the payoff or the, what the impact of a piece can be, I think it made more pragmatic sense for me to, you know, kind of um, focus, the, focus the kind of capital of the piece on the traditional kind of peer review publication than just doing it um, via the public. Um, sure, I could have written a blog post, but I didn't, yeah, I, I just, you know your work better than anyone else. And I think you can make a decision on whether a part of your work makes more sense um, strategically, like for professionalization for the public versus that. I think I earlier mentioned like, um, you know, the, the creative writing piece. So it's just like, for me, just, it was for me, I looked at it writing publicly because I was just initially just trying to think through it. Now I have a sense of that. And, you know, via the way publishing operates, like it's not hard to necessarily get like permission to reference like a piece that's already been published. You, people do this with peer review pieces when they're writing their books, right? Um, you know, thinking about that now, knowing what I can do for it, would do with that moment specifically for the bigger dissertation or book project that will be coming in you know, a couple of years. Um, I think it's just, yeah, you have to have a, it's again, like you knowing yourself better than anyone and um, really, what do you want? Like, you know, if also if you're not necessarily like um, going into academia, maybe you are trying to kind of do something like um, less traditional than like, sure, you can take more risks with that. Um, but again, you have to kind of have a better, you have to have a sense of where you are professionally would make that decision. Michelle, do you have thoughts on this? The... I think I would argue the opposite, but I also think, <laughs> I mean, I also think you make a really good point, really good points, I should say. Um, but I think that, you know, I think it's so important to develop your voice and it's through these popular pieces that you can best do that. And I think that as you write the pieces, the choice bits are becoming choicier in a sense. They're, you know, one thing leads to another. You're, you're, you know, you're growing your muscles again and that, that it doesn't really involve a loss. But then of course, that's where I'm coming from. I'm the, <laughs> you know, um, but I, I think you have more to gain than to lose, I guess, yeah. in terms of your intellectual growth. I mean, it's, you know, it's true. Somebody else may take up your idea and run with it, but they won't run with it in the way that you would run with it. You know, it's always, it's never going to be, you know, they're never going to succeed in really stealing your, you know, stealing your idea as it were, I don't think. But yeah, um, yeah again, I mean, you, you can disagree, but yeah. Um, you know, it's also like I said with these popular pieces, you're 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 developing your style um, and your confidence. Maybe maybe that's even more important. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I also think these popular pieces um, teach you, you know, how you can use your personal experience, um, you know, make it do work for you that you can then use in your books you know you, you know a, a book doesn't you know think of shaping again a book does not have to be dry um you know he's always marrying um intertwining the mundane and the you know the esoteric that's what makes a lot of his writing pop um and, and again i think that's you, you know you can you can hone that skill in these popular pieces um but lee what do you think yeah. Um, I mean, I've always been a kind of a let it all hang out kind of person when it comes to this. And I've never really held back. But I mean, I think part of that is, you know, there's this whole kind of thing in my nuclear family about how we all have ADHD or something. And I always have like a million ideas going on. And 
And so a lot of times I'm, I use these smaller pieces to kind of explore things that I really want to explore, but they're not like the central thing for me. Um, and, you know, the only thing, the only time I've found myself um, kind of buying into people maybe holding back is when they found when it's historians who find like documents that are like an actual find mm -hmm. um you know mm -hmm. and like it's going to change the way we tell the story yeah i feel like you don't want to dump that into the, no. the public into public because you could get scooped by a journalist yeah. for instance who's going to write yeah. a lot faster than you yeah. um and the only other thing that i've had of this is that you know i wrote a public or a popular book recently for penguin random house and they were much more concerned about this splitting things off issue and like going on the radio before the book was ready to go and all these things, they were, they were much more concerned about it than I think academic presses tend to be. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind, like your relationship with your press and what kind of press it is, yeah. I think another thing also that's important to keep in mind is to like let nothing go to waste you know, so whether it's a seminar paper or something that you have like cut out of a book chapter or whatever, I mean, almost everything can be turned into something. And I guess I always kind of refer to these, you know, as orphans, you know, like the things that I have cut out of a book chapter or whatever, but they become little things or maybe big things in their own right. And I think it's important not to lose track of them, but also not to lose track of the different places where those things can find a, a happy home. Mm -hmm. So we had a question in the chat and we're definitely going to have um, some time at the end to go over questions from the chat, but I thought it was good just like from a clarification point of view. Um, and that's what venues and periodicals can you expect to send a pitch to that is like short and just like an outline of your idea versus something that like is fully formed. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so, so I've got that sort of like mechanical question for you guys if yeah. um, you guys know and then um michelle you alluded in your presentation to sort of the nuts and bolts of like what constitutes a successful pitch um and i was wondering if you have seen anything that you can share um about especially successful um graduate student pitches that you've seen in the past and then lee and victoria um, I was wondering um, if you guys also had had stuff that's like gone over particularly well, like when sort of embarking mm -hmm. on this process. So just to quickly handle the, the first question from Jenny, uh, there are a lot of newspapers do want you to send the, the language, um, though some, you just need to look at the web, the, the newspaper portals, because they'll tell you whether they want a brief synopsis or the six to 800 words, whatever. And then, you know, for instance, that maintainer's piece that um, it had various lives and had gone through a bunch of different places. We sent it to the Times, we sent it to the Washington Post, and finally it was placed. So that was more or less a 800 word piece of writing that we were trying out at different venues. Uh, the, my point about the short pitch is really when you have like a personal relationship with editors um, so, you know, I have an editor at the Chronicle and I have Sam Asselby at Eon and Michelle, you know, like I would, I would send them as brief as possible, but I think I can get it down because um, they're busy folks. Yeah. Yeah. So for a neophyte, you, you, you would want the longer pitch. Um, I mean, but not too long. <laughs> I mean, you know, two paragraphs is maybe about right. Um, because I, you know, it, I want to get a sense of your writing first, and you know, I want to see if you can articulate a hook. Um, um, but a, a couple other things um, in terms of like pitch, uh, in terms of pitching in general, um, you should always consult the masthead before you pitch and figure out exactly who you want to target. Um, so uh, people often will simply write to the editor-in-chief but you know the editor-in-chief is you know got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails every day and he's you know not likely to forward you that the the, the pitch or you know he may or he may not she she, she may or may not um, um you know it, it, i mean typical advice is pitch a, a story not a topic 
Um, the reason for that is because you want the you want you want the piece to move. These small pieces have to have momentum. They have to you know hook the the, the reader. Um, so so you know if you're sort of conveying that you that you know that you can also you know it's helpful if you say I'm going to start out too with this a particular vignette and then you know how to do that. Um, you need to tell. Uh, the editor, why you're the person um, to write, you know, um, on a particular topic, um, and, and if you're if you're a grad student, well, you obviously say it's relevant to something in your dissertation or your field work or whatever. Um, you need to be always marrying um, specificity to larger stakes, right? Um, telling me why it matters, um, why I should care about it. Um, you know, and then in terms of, you know, more generally, you know, what are, you're, 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 you know, you're either lifting the veil somehow or turning the screw on some, on a particular topic or saying, you know, you think things are, are this way. Well, in fact, they're that way. You think there's a crisis of truth? No, I'm going to turn the screw on that. You know, that would be shaping or, you know, a Massimo piece. Um, you think that 1930s, um, in, Italian academics were anti-fascist. Well, I'm going to turn the screw on that. Um, uh, you think that Galileo deserved all the credit for the sp spy spyglass? No, I'm going to turn the screw. He was, you know, he had sharp elbows. Um, the other thing, you know, that's, you know, you can your research may not be directly related in any way to current events, but you can find maybe a way in which, you know, it is, and that can be your point of departure, you know. And in these, in these pieces, um, personal experience, you know, can, can, can work really well, you know, during your field work, for instance. Um, What's, you know, what's difficult is when there's a good hook in that's in bad writing, um, because then I know that's going to be a lot of work. Um, because, yeah, the hook is great, but, <laughs> you know, that's going to be, you know, 10 drafts. Um, a bad hook in good writing, that's when I would say, not this one, try again. Come nice. back. <laughs> Can I ask a quick follow-up question, Patrick, before you segue into our next part of the conversation? Um, amazing. So, okay, because because it's sort of like a part B of the question that I asked you guys is sort of like, how did you figure out who to reach out to, right? Like, was mm -hmm. this something where you tapped your network? Did you go on to the website and, you know, look at the masthead? I'm, I think I know what a masthead is, but also I'm not sure what a masthead is. Um, and just sort of like, how, you know, how does one sort of find the correct person um, to send their thing. I think for me, it was a matter of, it was a kind of combination. Um, yeah, I think it was like, oftentimes like a news, uh, digital media outlets like often have a link, like it's sometimes buried at the very bottom will like actually say masthead. Um, so you can find the editor specific sections that way. Um, but also uh, this is also where Twitter is very, very helpful and getting a sense of the media ecosystem because you not only kind of see what pieces, are published, but oftentimes you can see like what the, who are the editors who are writing, who are the editors for specific sections, if there are like publications where it may not be as easily accessible, um, that the masthead information. Um, and it's also a kind of way to potentially get in touch with an editor that way. Um, yeah, I think it's, and then in, again, and also networks, um, yeah. I think it's a combination, yeah. Victoria, yeah. I think that's a great point. I mean, I just finished a five-year stint editing a journal and I would sometimes get these things sent to me and I'm like, did you look at the journal ever? Like, do you, like, we don't publish scientific articles. We're a history of science journal. Yeah. Um, random thought. I, I a different question, especially since you're about, Victoria, to move to you know, a new institution and a new part in your career. I was sort of curious about how you're thinking about, you know, sort of the expected institutional standards, customs, you know, what have you, but your own sort of personal wish to continue cultivating your own voice as a writer 
as a public facing writer, I guess, if you have some thoughts on that, I'd love to hear that. It'd be great. Um, yeah. Um, so I think one thing to also keep in mind is that um, this is one of the reasons I'm really excited to be joining the Rice Anthropology Department um, is that it's one that has a reputation for experimenting with writing, particularly in anthropology. And so um, like I think uh, I think there was an earlier question from Baker, if I'm not mistaken, about kind of like playing it safer, um, kind of, yeah, balancing institutional voice um, with playing it safe. And I'm, I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not naive about <laughs> what will be entailed being on tenure, like being on the tenure track. Um, but I don't know, I think it's, I think it's more so for me trying to figure out how to use the kind of legacy of experimenting with writing in the institute at that institution to my advantage. I don't know what that is, but um, that's also something maybe when people, this is also part of professionalization, people thinking about things kind of post graduate school and all those things like take very serious, like again, the, the public work doesn't have to be kind of outside necessarily. And so if that is something that's really important to you, like, take that seriously when you're thinking about jobs. And maybe that might be something um, both within academia, maybe also outside of it. Um, if that's really important to you, consider the spaces where that, that will allow you to really flourish in figuring that out. Um, did that answer your question, Patrick? That was a great way of getting to it. I, yeah, that, okay. yes, yes it did. Okay. Yeah, I think it, it. You know, I think you do have to be cognizant of these issues and where you're at. You know, I always felt very lucky that um, at Stevens, my at my earlier job, I had people around me uh, pushing or encouraging me to do popular writing. So the science journalist John Horgan was there. Alex Wellerstein, who writes for you know the New Yorker, was there. Um, and so then it was just kind of a thing. And then you know Virginia Tech values it values the kind of public facing um, stuff I do. We'll see how much because, you know, I'm really planning on going more and more in this direction and, and really probably primarily doing the popular writing for the next little while. And we'll see how it plays in academia. I don't know, but I'm willing to take the risk. So, you know, yeah. I think well, to be the kind of to I, to be the play the risk averse part of my personality, I would say there are, you know, there are places I have seen people put a lot of and put a lot of energy into this stuff and not get the book done or not get whatever that thing is that's going to get you tenure done and torpedo themselves. So I was always a good little boy checking the boxes to make sure to get the academic press book done and to get a journal article out once a year. Um, so, you know, that's part of it too. And that's, I think, what I was trying to get at earlier with like the discussion of like, how do you delegate certain pieces for public facing versus say for peer review? Again, you just have to be pragmatic. Like I'm gonna get tenure off of peer review. And like, if there's some piece that like, quite frankly, even though it would, it would I could write it for like a blog post for anthropology news. Like if I also see that there's a critical intervention that can make my career, I'm gonna save it for a peer review journal. And if, and I like, mm. For me, try to use it, do it with one that allows me to kind of be, um, gives me more freedom and leeway with the form of the argument as a peer review. Like, it, again, it's just like, be strategic. And I think it's just like those kinds of things, I think, help also kind of get, um, help you get a kind of clarity on um, productivity with public writing. I think Patrick mentioned earlier, like, you know, yes, keep those various like papers for seminars and all these things. Like you don't have to throw them away. It's not to say that they are useless beyond um, beyond the seminar or dissertation or whatever. Um, but you also don't necessarily want to just get hooked in to just public writing. And I think especially because of how often public writing is having to deal with, with media, the like 24 hours news cycle and just the, the, the rapidity of production, it can also be unsustainable for yourself, um, period. So just, again, you know yourself, you know, you should know what you need to do, to, like keep a roof over your head. Like these are basics um, while also um, reaching out on the ivory tower um yeah so i would okay i'd love to come back to the question of keeping your roof over your head um 
in a second because I think that that's also a really important thing to discuss. Um, but I did have a question um, in the meantime. Um, Patrick totally got blocked by Elon Musk once, and it reminded me to ask that if you guys. Still have <laughs> okay, he's, he still is blocked. Um, but have you guys ever had a troll or somebody like respond really negatively to you online or to like anything that you've ever written? Um, and if so, how did you handle that? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I So um, when I was writing at Vox, um, because I was also like a, write, a race and identity writer, like there was a whole thing with just like those of us in the identity section. So talking about issues around gender, sexuality, race, like um, it wasn't necessarily trolls on Twitter, but it was kind of like the harassment via emails. I mean, like you really have to like when you're public writing, I think it's important, like not being naive about the ways you have to like voice is not just about writing, but I think also having kind of security of self with like the different kind of negative <laughs> like blowbacks you can get, which is not even necessarily about you. It's oftentimes about other people who have their own kind of ideas that your writing may be pushing against and you're dealing with somebody else's ego independently of anything you did. And it was like a kind of thing you could realize that with, <laughs> if a piece had like reached like, I don't know, Yahoo News, <laughs> you can realize then, oh, okay, my inbox is gonna be filled with people who are like, you know, like, literally trolling me with racist statements and harassing me. Um, and like sometimes having a good point with like taking my email off. So like people can, I mean, like that's a real thing. Um, and I think it's just like, don't engage to the best of your ability. Um, especially it's like trolls on Twitter or people, like people, that's just a thing. Um, but you have to, again, what's your sense of self um, when you're doing that? Michelle, you, were, you write about gender and like, female reproduction issues too. I mean, have you ever gotten trolled over those pieces? Oh, Michelle, you're muted. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I did in the early years of the century, I would mm -hmm. get, because I, yeah, I would write somewhat provocative pieces and, and I would get pushed back, but I, I just ignore, I just ignore them. Um, as an editor, I um, when I when I accept someone's pitch and then I have to reject their mm. their actual article, I then um, you know that's always a dicey situation for me. That's where I get you know some, some sometimes a lot of venom, or you know sometimes when I reject a pitch, it's um, you know there's all kinds of people out there. God. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we all know that when it comes to this stuff, like women and, and racial minorities and you know, other people who, you know, LGBTQ people they get it much more than kind of folks like me. I, I did write a, I wrote a piece, I wrote a critical piece about Elon Musk called Whitey on Mars uh, <laughs> that uh, pissed off a bunch of Musk bros. And so we definitely got it over that. Um, and we, you know, Andy and I have gotten beat up we write provocative things and that are meant to get people going and so it does sometimes and but i'm guessing you haven't gotten death threats lee never a death threat yeah in the so, way that some of our colleagues have received things like that yeah exactly yeah i've you know i had stan the stanford d school writing nasty emails about me too their people, but like, <laughs> but never got a death threat and never, yeah, I just don't, you know, there's a different kind of vitriol that women and, you know, people all, you know, all the kind of non-white guy cis presenting people get that people like me just don't get, so, yeah. Yeah, so we've got like eight-ish minutes or so before we open up, um, we open up the floor to um, questions from the audience. Um, and so, so one question that I did really want to ask um, is um, how you guys have balance, this is kind of similar to Patrick's earlier question about, you know, sort of balancing your, you know, sort of popular writing with stuff that's actually going to like, you know, get you on the tenure track. Um, but I'm wondering, like, like, should we be asking to be paid is that not like sh should we not ask that like like how have you navigated like trying to also financially support yourself um while writing and do you have any tips for us 
I mean, so I will say I was definitely doing a lot of my blogging, like for instance, when I had like an NSF, like early on in my like grad career, like in terms of funding, like I could take the risk of writing for free. Like that's not a small thing. Um, and, you know, I think, especially when it comes to blogs that are ac academic blogs, you know, I, I think one conversation to be had is like, you know, really finding ways to find funding for these places. I mean, it's just like, it's oftentimes these academic blogs where people are kind of using to break in to the places where, I mean, like there's there's no reason why you should be writing for the, like Washington Post and not being expected to get paid. Like you get paid for literary journals, like you should, yeah, you you can, you should very much so be getting a, some kind of like, a, a, a fee for what you're writing. And that's kind of negotiated between yourself and the writer or editor um, when the pitch is um, accepted. Um, but I, I wish that like institutions did a better job of like directing funding to blogs so that also that would get people prepared to one, like pay, pay academics who are oftentimes junior faculty, graduate students, like adjunct uh, people who are working at adjunctships who are leading these efforts, pay them, like find money to pay them. So like pay them to have the skills to write, pay them to have the skills to train themselves to edit, edit their peers. I mean, like we, even it's something, it might not be like a thousand dollars, which is like what you will get with like bigger publications, but um you know maybe right now early on you might not get paid i think there should be we should be talking about ways to find funding for the blogs um but you know especially when you're going beyond blogs you absolutely should be expecting to get paid absolutely i kind of want to pivot in a different direction and this I've probably victoria you're, you might be the best person to start with given uh, something you said earlier about um thinking about genetics and whatever and i guess the question is um, you know, we're doing work in science and technology studies. Um, based on your approach to thinking about this, I mean, how, how do you sort of navigate like how much science, how much technology you actually need to know the nuts and bolts of in order to persuade an audience, to reach different audiences, and mm -hmm. to sort of secure the credibility that you know to be an expert? I mean, <laughs> I think with, so I think some of this with my writing was talking about like writing on science technology, a lot of it comes from like being trying to do that via Vox explainer method. <laughs> so um, via explainer, like it's a kind of presumption that this person is capable of understanding a thing. And I think it's like how, it's just really, how do you like, how do you just make the kind of evidence like clear to someone? Like, how do you explain in a major article that was just published about like, uh, I don't know, um, white people in the South who take genetic ancestry tests, like finding out they quote unquote have African ancestry. It's just like breaking down an article um, and then giving the why, like, you know, Michelle was talking earlier about the pitches and like, you need to tell, it's not just it's not just explaining for like explanatory sake. It's what's the why? Why does this matter to know something now? Um, I think that's, yeah, I don't, um, I think it's the, rather than kind of knowing the science, I think it's like really, really kind of honing the skill of translatability of like, um, yeah, just learning how to translate expertise. I think that's really it. Um, no, I think that's great. I mean, translatability is, is a nice way of capturing, I think, what you just said there. I kind of want to kick it again over to Michelle and Lee, because both of them also write about pretty complex and esoteric subjects as well. And that whole process of making it accessible to a variety of public facing yeah. people is, is, is important and challenging. I, mean, I think that um, Victoria said it so well. It's, it, it really is about do you have a knack for, for translating and for condensing stuff in a really interesting way. Um, you know, so much of good writing is about being pithy. Um, I, I mean, this is just a sort of interesting tidbit may, maybe, but um, my problem is not STS scholars writing about what they don't know, but about it's more um, physicists trying to write about, um, you know, STS subjects and thinking they have a lot to say. and you know, you know, not getting any of the nuance. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's great. I hadn't thought about it actually from, from the other, the yeah. other 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm thinking of this review that's coming up, the John Dupre re review um, or essay review. Um, you know, I mean, it, one of the reasons why that review actually works so well is because he's really getting down there in the weeds and he's really done his homework. Um, and so, you know, that's why he's able to critique these books because he's done, you know, the homework better than the authors have. Um, yeah. And, you know, you, and you really get a sense of that. Um, so, and so, of course, it makes it more powerful. But um, Lee, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I would go back to something you, you were saying earlier about just good writing and making things feel concrete and specific. Yeah. You know, I think that that's the heart. It's translating the ideas, but making it feel really gritty to the reader in a way that is the trick. Um, I do think people need to be careful. I see it sometimes in like, I have like back channels in the history of computing world. You know, I'm plugged into that. And some of the back channels are very like grumpy guys who worked in industry their entire lives and actually care about the details. And they see like people from like cultural studies writing things about making big claims about the way computers work and totally getting the details wrong. Uh, and I think, it, you know, you, if you if you biff the details, it will it will stand out to some readers at least. Right. So I do think you need to take care. But there's also there you can also go too far down that rabbit hole. So it's about balance somehow. But I think, Lee, that speaks to the whole importance of, you know, cultivating a network of kind and gentle readers who are also informed, who can read this and point out places where it yeah. needs a little bit of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so it's 5.30, so I think that we can move on to questions from the chat. Um, so it looks like first up, we have a question from Emily, um, and it's addressed to all of you. Um, and it is, is it possible to use public writing to build an audience for our academic writing, specifically books? Um, and what would be a good way to do that? Oh yeah, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, the, you know, if the, the book market today, uh, if you do a book proposal, even for academic presses, but especially for popular ones, they really want to know about, you know, your platform. Some of them use this kind of gross term to, and what your platform is, your Twitter followers, your blog, anything that you're using to kind of get ideas out there. And people have still are using blogs very, um, productively in this way. I would say Patrick did a really great job with his Visioneers book, which was had a bloggy uh, element to it. But the other person I would point to, I think is really terrific in this way is Jay Verdi. Um, her book, Hearing Happiness, um, you know, she had like 10 or 10,000 or more followers of her blog before she wrote that book. And she was able to like bring that to the press and the presses were very, very interested in that thing. So I think that that, you know, you can definitely use these tools to kind of build, build an audience beforehand. And then, you know, Jay's book has been very, um, very uh, successful in a lot of ways. And I think that that her, the, the kind of audience she built beforehand was really a big part of making that happen. I also um, think you should keep in mind that when you write these popular pieces that there are scouts out there in the publishing world who are actually who are reading these pieces and who especially if you're a young person are very likely to contact you and say what's up your sleeve what else can you do and you know I mean it, all the academic presses have people who do that and there's also aid and agents at very prominent places that that may contact it, contact you they're looking they're actively looking for the next thing coming up the pipeline um, and they're competing. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, you're, you're, you're getting a ton of exposure that you don't see, but that that's there. Um, you may think you're, you know, you may think your piece is going into oblivion, but it, that could be very far from the case. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree I would with just, that. I'm sorry. I would, I oh, no, sorry. I was just going to um, mention like, I, like a previously had signed with a literary agent based on the um, uh, creative nonfiction piece that happened to engage with my fieldwork, but like it was not really 
um, yeah, it's just, it's, they happen to have come across it and reached out. I mean, this is, that's very, very common. Um, and it's also very, it's becoming increasingly more common for academic writers to actually have literary agents who will even be kind of dealing with the like, even academic presses <laughs> when dealing with book proposals, even yeah. for your tenure track. Um, so I think, yes, absolutely. The public writing goes back to your academic work. I think it's just, again, this is more, so I think it's a lot just about you and what you're trying to do um, more than anything. It's not, it's not possible. It's just, what do you want to be doing with it? It's a popular. I'm sorry, go ahead, Lee. But the popular book that I wrote came from a literary agent contacting me and Andy after we wrote the Hail the Maintainers piece for Eon. So, I mean, that's how it works very often. I was just going to say just really briefly in response to Michelle, it just reminded me of a, of a cutting book review that I read that um, it was basically, this is a book that should have remained a tweet. Um, so, you know, there's that way as well. But I think also if this conversation goes in the, in the direction of, of more academic publishing. I've got a couple thoughts that I'd like to add if, if, if uh, we go in that direction. But Jenny asked a really good question, which I have like no idea how to think about this, about how one uh, sort of identifies and ranks popular venues in terms of there being like a, a hierarchy um, in the way that you sort of have top tier academic journals versus mm -hmm. uh, what have you. Um, I have no idea. I mean, I don't yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe Lee, we could start with you because you've done stuff both for NYT as well as WAPO. So, yeah, I mean, those are kind of, I mean, it really depends on what you want to do, first okay. of all, I would say. So, you know, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal are the kind of big national, they have very different audiences, obviously, but they're the big national ones. And then, you know, like sometimes the LA Times or, you know, papers in Texas, it really depends on who you're trying to communicate with. Sometimes it makes more sense to go to your city newspaper than anywhere. And then I think, you know, then, then you were talking about uh, the LA Review of Books and Eon. These have totally different audiences. So it really, it really comes down to who you want to talk to in the end. I mean, it's really about trade-offs. Um, you know, some... So, some places um, like the Times Literary Supplement that I write for or the um, London Review of Books, they have paywalls, right? So your piece kind of, you get, you know, you get paid a lot, not a lot, but, you know, you, a fair amount, but your piece disappears. Mm. Um, um, the other thing is that, you know, some have, a, it's a really long time till publication or the editorial process is really long and you know you you send in your piece and you have to wait three months then somebody edits it then the second reader edits it and then it's another three months and you know the book was that you're reviewing was published last year and you know so on and so forth um so you, you know it, it depends what matters to you um yeah, I think, um, I mean, I'm just going to reiterate what both Michelle and Lee have been saying. And I think that's like, I'm personally not of the ilk that I, I, I think Jenny mentioned in the chat, they want to talk to everybody. Um, I'm not necessarily particularly of the ilk, like I'm not, I'm more concerned about the message that I'm trying to convey and making sure it gets to the particular people, if other people are involved, so be it. Um, but like, yeah, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> um, I, I think, again, it's about you have to recognize what your voice is and what your your ethical relationship to a public is. Because, um, I mean, yes, this, I mean, I think sometimes you talk about public engagement like as an inherent good, and I don't know if that's inherently true. Um, if we're just using the public for accumulation of social capital, I think we also need to be more transparent about that. And like, if, that, if that's what it is, so be it. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're doing inherently like more ethical work because you're doing that outside of academia when it's actually going back to you accumulating capital as an academic. Um, again, what's your why? I have a follow-up question for Michelle. Um, you you sort of you sort of alluding to um, you know kind of like the sort of like timing the timeline of these things. And one thing that I've always wondered about um, is that I like sometimes we'll like see book reviews 
for books that like came out kind of a long time ago like is there like a cutoff line for like when you should like okay this book is now like 10 years old like we <laughs> were fine like we've got this covered versus like like you know you know versus like okay here's something that people actually want to read a review of because it's like a new book yeah no it has to be a new book I mean and new being somewhat loose but you know preferably when you pitch it's a forthcoming book oh. um so you can see what's forthcoming in the catalogs um but you know if it's a just published book that would be fine too and you know sometimes you if you you're doing a review of several books then you know some of those books could be published you know a couple years ago mm -hmm. but at least one of the books you'd like you know would like to be current current being, you know, just published or about to be published. So Michelle, a lot of these catalogs are available online and, you know, it's, you can of course look through different publishers web pages and see what's forthcoming. I mean, it, one strategy potentially would be to just make that sort of part of a weekly or, you know, every few weeks look through and then see what is looking like it's going to be interesting. And yeah, you, yeah, you could make it seasonal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, that's, that's, that's a good strategy. Hmm. But then how do you, so, so if you look at a forthcoming book list and you're like, ah, okay, here is a book about outer space. Like I have things to say about outer space. Like, how, like, do you have tips for sort of shaping a, an interesting pitch sort of before you know what the book is about? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, a lot of people will pitch without having read the book and, you know, they'll pitch saying, oh, I have this particular angle on this topic. And um, in my case, I'll say, okay, if it's somebody who's written for me before and I know they can, you know, pull something off, um, for a new writer, I might, you know, say, well, maybe you need to, you know, look at the book first. Yeah. I feel like if grad school has prepared me to do anything, it's to write about books that I have not yet read. <laughs> Wait, say that again? I said, I feel like if grad school has prepared me for anything, it's to write about books that I have not yet read. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Seminar Lois. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, I got one last question for you guys too. Or, and then Patrick, if you have anything. Um, I also wanted, this is also kind of like sort of logistical, um, but I wanted to know um, if you guys have a website that you maintain, if like that is something that's like on your radar where you like compile all of the Badly. Things, right? Badly, okay, badly, okay. Yeah. But so like how much time do you spend like sort of cultivating your online identity sort of like, you know, on top of the written work that you produce? I mean, I feel like it's pretty standard to like have a website, especially just like, have the way academia works today. I feel like everybody has a website and it's not even just like your department website. I mean, I think the fact of needing a website um, I think has been indicative by the way that universities are actually taking even graduate student websites like more seriously and how they're like how they're formatted. Um, like for me right now, like I've, for the most part, like set it up as having like either a WordPress. I just recently switched to Squarespace because I like it aesthetically. I think it's more aesthetically pleasing and also just easier to navigate. Um, and it's really simple. It's like <laughs> homepage, CV, about and like writing. And people have access to like the clips that I want to showcase. I don't have every single thing I've written period. Um, and now starting for me include like forthcoming like academic publications as well as popular writing um just something like easy and like for me like I, the the url is like my name <laughs> like so it's easy to get with like google seo um for just people to find me yeah you Seems have a sweet. nice web page <laughs> thank you <laughs> i just need to get a professional photographer so i'm not using an instagram photo for <laughs> my actual photo that would be great cool. do it later but yeah Rebecca uh, Baker raised a question about um, about this is probably more more of a Michelle question. Just sort of the nuts and bolts of getting books, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm embarrassed to say, and, you know, I mean, I get I get sent books all the time, Michelle. I know you get books sent all the time, but like, what do you do? Like, how do you get like an advanced copy if you're a graduate student or a postdoc or whatever, and you don't have a track record? Of, of having essays out there? Like, how, how do you get the goods? 
<laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Without paying for you it. You contact somebody like me and ask them to, <laughs> yeah. to put you in touch or to, to, to contact the publisher for you. Um, unless you're going to write you, unless somebody has told you, yes, you can write for, for my publication, I think it's probably going to be hard for you to get an advanced copy. Um, but if you say write to me, if if we agree that I'm that you're going to write a piece for me, then you can contact the publisher, or I can contact the publisher, and the publisher will very happily sell, send you one, maybe multiple copies, <laughs> advanced copies of <laughs> the book you want. Yeah, be careful what you ask for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. Sometimes you can get three. <laughs> Thank you so much. Neat. So, oh, let Patrick, if you have something, I feel like no. I was just going to ask you where we sort of are in your um, in your grand vision here. Yes, yeah. So the we've run through all of the questions um, from the chat, in addition to the ones that we drafted up for our moder or for our panelists. Um, so I feel like since we've been at this for about an hour and forty five minutes, uh, maybe it's time to come to a close. Um, Michelle, Lee, Victoria, Patrick, thank you guys all so much for being willing to share not only your time, but also all of your wonderful insights into this process. Um, I know that for me, the process of publishing something in a place that's not an academic journal is now like conceptually so much more clear. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, and we put your contact information in the chat, your Twitter handles, all of that stuff. Um, so thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Victoria. Good luck 